Today's lesson is on Core Practical 10. This is the final Core Practical for the Further Mechanics. It's a little bit of a strange one, um, and I'll explain to you why I say that later on. But the specification reference for home A-level is 100, and if you're doing international A-level, it's 84. And what it says is that you have to use ICT to analyze collisions between small spheres, for example, ball bearings on the tabletop, but you can use any small spheres. And this is a, an experiment you can actually do at home if you need to. To conduct this experiment, you need to download a video analysis tool like Tracker. This is completely free. It's open source software. The link where you can download it is on the left. And I will also put a link into the video on YouTube. However, you don't need to be able to use Tracker for A-level. The purpose of this experiment is not really can you use Tracker. The purpose of this experiment is the use of ICT to conduct experiments and also being able to construct a vector diagram for a two-dimensional collision. So I put a video on how to track something like this in my Patreon page. If you really want to know how to use Tracker, you can sign up for that. Otherwise, with this video, I'm just going to explain to you what you do and what you're trying to learn from the use of Tracker with 2D collisions like this. The idea is, is that you take two spheres and you leave one sphere stationary in the center of your frames, your camera frame, and then you collide a second sphere, you run it along here, so that you get this oblique collision and your two spheres go off in opposite directions. So that is what you're actually filming. And to set this up, you need two ball bearings, two ping pong balls, even tennis balls will work, although they're a little big for the video. And you set your camera with as many frames per second as you can have. Set your camera so that it's right above where the collision is going to happen. And then you just press start record and run the collision. It usually takes a few goes to get this absolutely right, but you're looking for a collision that looks something like this so that you can have a nice vector diagram to go with it. With the tracker software, then frame by frame, you can track the ball. So this is the incoming ball in red, and that is mass A, and it, so it comes in and it goes off to the left. The stationary, initially stationary ball, which is mass B, you can see it is in light blue over here versus red. Once it starts to move, you then track that. And you do that separately. And again, that'll be in a video on my Patreon page if you're really interested. The other thing you need to have in the video frame is some form of ruler so that you can have a scale. So you set your scale like this. The advice generally given is to, when you analyze the program is to turn the axes of the program so that the incoming ball runs along one of the axes. Horizontal or vertical, it doesn't really matter, because what you want to be able to do is to have no other dimension in your initial momentum. So your initial momentum is either all y momentum or it's all x momentum. You also need to measure the mass of the ball and input that into the software, and when you do that, Tracker will give you values for momentum along the x-axis, momentum along the y-axis for your red ball, and momentum along the x-axis and momentum along the y-axis for your blue ball. So your initially moving ball, the one that you actually push along the tabletop, and the original stationary ball. And you can see that there was no momentum along either x or y for the blue ball. So once you've done all of your tracking and you've got your momenta, the idea behind this core practical is that you then produce a vector diagram from it. Students often do this incorrectly. And I have an example here. So this is the ball incoming. And they think that by drawing a nice scale drawing of the two balls moving off in opposite directions with the angles that this is a vector diagram. This is useful because it gives you an initial picture of what you're actually looking at. So here, this isn't a vector diagram of the previous collision. Here we've got our angles. Uh, ball A went off at 0 0.03 kilograms meters per second at 45.8 degrees. And again, you can get angles from the tracker software. And that's the momentum and the angle for ball B. 
you then have to take this and draw a vector diagram from it. And the key here is that momentum must be conserved. And that vector diagrams have got to be tip to tail. So when you take your initial momenta and those angles and make a vector diagram of it, there's ball A up along this side. And you can see it's at an angle of 45.8 to the horizontal. And here is ball B at 28.6 to the horizontal again. And you have to draw them so that they're tip to tail. This is the initial incoming momentum. So this is ball A before the collision. The idea is, of course, that if momentum is conserved, your vector diagram should close because your initial momentum, your original momentum from ball A, should be equal to the combination of the momentum after. It should close both horizontally and vertically. Now, as you can see very clearly here, it does not close. We have some difference in horizontal momentum, so it has lost some horizontal momentum. This is most likely due to friction between the ball and the tabletop. It's also gained some vertical momentum. This is possibly because, and again, when you're giving, if you are given an example of a vector diagram like this that doesn't close, generally what you'd be asked to do is suggest reasons why. So if it doesn't close horizontally, the most sensible reason is that there is an external force acting, because remember, momentum is conserved provided no external force acts. So the most likely reason is that there is an external force, and again, the most likely force is likely to be friction. In terms of vertical momentum, you could lose some vertical momentum or you could gain some vertical momentum. And vertical here I'm talking about in the y direction. This is likely because there's either a slope, so that you, your balls gain some y momentum because they're rolling down a slope. And so this would seem to be the most likely explanation for the fact that we've gained some of that y momentum here. If it doesn't close, so if it's above and doesn't quite reach the axis down here, then that's likely to be because you've got a slight upward slope, and so the ball has lost some of its y momentum. The main theoretical purpose of Core Practical 10 is to be able to construct vector diagrams from data in an experiment. The main experimental purpose of Core Practical 10 is the advantages and disadvantages of using ICT in an experiment like this. And so we're going to go through the reasons why you might or have to use ICT. So the first reason is, of course, that this experiment would not be possible to conduct unless you could track the motion of the ball. It's simply too short an experiment. There's no way you could time it with a timer. The, you couldn't really properly measure it with a ruler, the distance that it traveled. You want to try and figure out the speed, obviously, in order to find the momentum. So this would be an impossible experiment to conduct without ICT. And so in that sense, it is improving the accuracy of your experiment. The main reason for using ICT here is that, of course, if you've got a high frame rate on your camera, and phone cameras now do have a relatively high frame rate, you can take many readings in a short time interval because you're doing them frame by frame. So with Tracker, you add a little spot on your uh, video for every frame. So you track the ball for every frame so you know that it's where its position is. And of course, you can automatically calculate the speed from that. The other advantage of using ICT here is that you can replay. So you run the collision. It takes a couple of seconds to run. Have a look at the video. If you're not happy with the position of the camera, if you're not happy with the way that the balls have separated and gone off in different directions, it's very easy to make an error. You can just redo it, re-video it, until you're happy with the collision that you get. There are disadvantages to using ICT with this experiment. The main one being a parallax error. Now, it isn't enough in an exam situation to just trot out parallax error and think that that answer solves all problems. You have to be very specific. So here, of course, we have to place the camera right above a certain point. And the most logical point to do that is right above the collision, because you're trying to figure out how your momentum divides up along your x and y axis after the collision. 
But of course, if you've got your camera right above where the collision is going to be, where you initially place your stationary ball, that means that all of your frames before have a slight parallax error, and all of the frames after have a slight parallax error. Now, it isn't very much because, of course, this collision does not take place over a large area of your table, but it is there and it does bear mentioning. The second one is that you may have an important event like the actual collision that happens between the frames, because again, this is a very quick experiment to run. If you do that, of course, you can always go back and retake the video so that the collision happens inside a frame. But that is a trial and error process. So you do need to be aware that your most important event could take place between frames. The third disadvantage with this particular uh, system is that, of course, you have to try, when you're using the tracker system, you place a little target and you click over where the center of the ball is. And that is a judgment call on your part. So for each frame, you have to say where the center of the ball is so that the software can track it. And there is some error over making that judgment, especially if you've got many, many frames to do. You're likely to become less accurate as you continue along. So there is some question over the accuracy of your marking of frames. You have to be very careful about that. In terms of ICT and the general use of ICT for experiments, there are a lot of situations in which we can use ICT to make our experimental data more accurate, more reliable, more precise. Make sure that you know the definitions of these terms, and I will do, do another video about this. However, it is generally not enough, like I said, with the parallax error, it's not enough just to trot out these pat phrases and think you're going to get marks for it. You're not. You have to apply these ideas to the particular experiment they're talking about. And it could be an experiment that is very familiar to you, like a trolley running down a ramp and you're using light gates to figure out the speed of the trolley. Or it could be an experiment that is completely unfamiliar to you and you're using a camera or you're using light gates to do that. Unless you're absolutely desperate, do not just trot out, it makes your readings more accurate. You can say it will make your readings more accurate, but you've got to justify that in terms of the actual experiment in front of you. Also, you should think about, in any general experiment, there have frequently been questions saying, how could you make this experiment more accurate? So things like um, a pendulum, so tracking the motion of a pendulum, or any motion experiment, really. If the person has done it manually, and the question asks you, how could you make this experiment more accurate, or how could you improve the accuracy of this experiment, consider an answer that includes video cameras. For all of the reasons that we've said above, you can replay it, you can slow down the motion, you can track the motion very carefully using a software like Tracker. So it should be in the back of your mind when you're looking at these practical questions to say, okay, is the use of a video camera appropriate here? Is it going to make it more accurate? And why? Remember, anytime you give an answer like that, you have to justify it in terms of the experiment in front of you.